1776, on September 11th, uh, they held a conference here with the British right after the uh, Declaration of Independence. Um, ben Franklin, Rutledge, and Adams, I believe, represented the uh, Americans. They were over on the first day, but they came across by barge and met with the British. That's for real. <laughs> That's for real. Very good. Um, also, uh, root beer. Mm -hmm. based on sassafras, and it's kind of a lot of those soft drinks. You get a little bit of the idea of the smell from this tree. It's a little late in the year. Right after me, some of them are left-handed and some of them are right-handed, so it really has four kinds of things. I think he's probably right. Uh, uh, looks like monkey brains we used to have oh, as yeah. a kid. Yeah. You know, green with little bumps on them. And the tree itself, um, when Europeans came to America, it was only found down around the Red River in Arkansas and Texas. It had once been common, but in the uh, subglacial habitat in the last ice age, when there were a lot of large mammals here, they ate the fruit and spread the seeds around. When they became extinct, there wasn't you know, anything to really keep the seeds moving, so the tree was dying out uh, because the animals had died out. The Osage Indians had been keeping it alive in their area because they used it for uh, bows and arrows. It's got very good wood for it. That's something you really want to see. This is ragweed. Uh, <laughs> and you notice its flowers, aren't they beautiful? That's why it gives you a hay fever. It doesn't have pretty, pretty flowers to attract insects, rather. It shakes the pollen around in the air and it's wind pollinating. The pollen gets into our noses and causes hay fever and that kind of thing. A lot of people blame goldenrod, or at least used to, but goldenrod is pollinated by bees, so it keeps its pollen to itself for the most part. It's the ragweeds that are a problem. Fortunately, there's not much of it around anymore as there used to be. And the species are anywhere from an oh, inch and a half to two inches or so long. And uh, if you take them apart, you can find out what they ate. It's been a very popular uh, science activity in schools for oh, about 20 years now. Um, one time, though, again, about 20 years ago, one of my parents uh, my student's parents at school said he was going to bring in an owl's nest. It's kind of unusual because owls usually make nests inside the tree. And uh, what it was was actually the accumulated owl pellets uh, that this, these barn owls had been regurgitating, I guess for a couple of years. Because he brought in a bag that was literally a cubic yard. It was a big lawn bag, and I had kids going through that for years uh, as owl pellets. You know, we sterilize a little bit and wear gloves. And uh, we found that the barn owls, and this was near the landfill, because it had been a long Arctic Hill Road. Uh, the barn owls ate mostly meadow mice, or meadow voles, it was their main diet. There were some rat bones in there. Short-tailed shrews were also fairly common, and every now and then we'd uh, find bird skulls in there, and birds they'd eaten as well. But that was kind of neat, you know. Uh, you know, some of our local owls, seeing what they ate. That's where they came from, but they kind of like the environment down here, and every now and then you might see a grand or a bowl. So, keep your eyes open. In the evening, you'll sometimes see them feeding around the grass and then bounding off. Uh, to confuse things further, though, there are also muskrats down here, and particularly in the spring when it's raining and a lot of this area is flooded, you can see muskrats, ground which which normally you don't see in the same place running across the trails here. Further down over there. From where the lighthouse is, on to the Jersey Shore. That's South Amboy, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there, and actually on this side, too. And one of the best places for oysters and clams. The sudden turn kind of goes way out here and then cuts back up in here. And that's fairly deep, but otherwise the water here isn't much more than 15 feet deep going across there. And uh, you'll sometimes see fishermen, you know, wading out a half a mile at low tide, mm -hmm. you know, fishing. Uh, but it's a great environment for the uh, oysters and the clams. And, uh, Chowder clam, or cherry stone if it's smaller. These are the one of the primary reasons the Indians came here. Uh, they're nice meaty clams. Besides using them for food, the shells, particularly this purple area here, would be made into beads, which would then be sewn into belts, wampum, and and this would be the purple color on the wampum. The white color, I'm told, came from the uh, center spiral of the uh, welts. And prior to meeting the Europeans, these were fairly large beads, but once the Europeans showed up with metal tools, uh, 
they were able to make smaller beads. Another one from the Brazilian Museum was actually uh, post-European period of like smaller beads, older stuff had been. But the Latin name of this is Mercenaria Mercenaria, which means money, money. On the inside, they make another material called knacker or mother of pearl, and uh, that's a lot shinier and it's a lot denser. Uh, and of course, any mollusk can actually make a pearl. There's certain oysters that make them more often than others, and in the Orient, and they're uh, farmed actually. But you'll sometimes find little pearls in these. If you find a pile of oyster and clam shells in land, those are usually Indian middens, which are basically when they suck the clams, they threw them on the big First pile. First <laughs> Well, it was organic, you know. I mean, it'll be recycled. Oh, my goodness. It's still alive. Yeah, horseshoe crab. These guys, for the most part, are they don't know way out of the age continent. Age, so. right? hmm? They can't figure out the age for these things. Yeah, well, in turn, no, they... Yeah. Uh, no, they're actually, well, from their basic size, and there are a few other indications. Uh, I know the eyes. Yeah. 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 This was the victim of another predator, not a seagull. Any idea what the predator was? There's a clue. Snail. Yes, yeah, snail. <laughs> that drill hole here was made by a, either a moon snail. Actually, it's probably a moon snail. There's a moon snails. They're the fairly large ones. I saw a few of them back there. Both they and the oyster drill, which are the coolest snails, drill holes through clam shells and essentially then put their biscuits in and eat the poor clam in his own shell. Shell. But they make these really neat deviled eggs. They rasp you like a little piece of sandpaper. They just work their right, right down in. This is a nice one. There it is. And the road is gone. The cement is more recent, but if you look over here, this, oh, here's a piece of a curve. And this gravel is from the old. The odd pan. And we have what I'm standing on right here. But you see some of the gray clay, which is very typical around the island. The redder clay above it's a little washed down the Arthur Hill. You know, along with that. Also, you'll sometimes find, usually it's gray though. It's a gray shale, or gray slate. Yeah, that was sure. once from, uh, you know, uh, roofs. Yeah. And then you'll sometimes see the holes that were drilled through and that the uh, The tide changes a little bit every day depending on the exact position of the sun and the moon. Essentially, the moon is pulling the water towards it. And actually, the tide lags behind it a little bit. So it's really pretty pretty uh, and the sun has a little bit of an effect as well. But their positions relative to one another will cause the high tides to rise to different levels. So you see some very high tides up there. And this is probably the more recent high tide line right along here. But that's where the most interesting is three of them that up here. grows up on. They look nice and, you know, full, but they're growing up areas that were once fields are becoming forests, and the whole ecosystems are changing, but it means there's less area for those invasive species. So some things like ragweed, which were all over the place back in the 60s, yeah. you don't see anywhere near as much of it as you right. do nowadays. However, the but on the other hand, you don't see as many rabbits or pheasants, because they also like that type of field environment. But the part of the is the bulldog. Particularly nice, cult, full of colors, and these particular plants don't have seeds on them. The seed pods stay on the plant to provide birds with food all winter long. So there are also artifacts from the 1700s and 1800s back along here. We're going to take a quick look at one of them. Probably goes back to like the 1930s. And they were tapping it over and into a circle. Look at the way they crowned it into. Mm -hmm. That was fairly commonly done. Down in the uh, woods by Page Avenue, where the uh, Butler Man had been. There were also a couple of wells back in the woods like this. I'm kind of surprised Parks hasn't done anything to 
Make sure nobody pulls out. Oh, it will have some taste in it. Bring it coming back up. Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's the black one. Mm. Taking care of them. Well, you know the glass pool is they went right over with the mower, oh. and the spring, the you know, plants just came up all around them. So every now and then I stopped here and I tried to pull the weeds around and look. You got to be careful over there. Some poison ivy in there. They get in here and they'll come out of here. But this is all uh, prickly pear cactus, which is native to the coastline on the eastern seaboard. Over in Sandy Hook, there's some nice big areas of it coming back in the dunes. But here on Staten Island, people have pretty much put most of it out. I actually kept it down in two hours this time. <laughs> Last time I had to walk to Page Avenue Beach, it was supposed to be two hours, and I think we went on for about three and a half. <laughs> it was a nice afternoon. I didn't have any place to go. So. <laughs> hey, I worked. But thank you all for coming out, and I uh, encourage you to you know, visit the park again, but particularly in uh, dusk.